Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And a couple of lectures ago in EC3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at the base response of common emitter amplifiers via the method of short circuit time constants. In this lecture, we'll look at the treble response of common emitter amplifiers via open circuit time constants. And I put the word treble here because I spend a lot of time thinking about musical application of circuits. But really, when the kind of effects we're going to talk about in this lecture come into play, you're usually at frequencies above the audio range. So this is usually only an issue in things like radio frequency applications. So here's the basic common emitter amplifier that we've looked at over and over. The capacitors shown here are ones that we choose to put into the circuit. The kinds of capacitances that we'll talk about in this lecture, in contrast, tend to be parasitic capacitances. So it's a little bit confusing because I just said we're going to use the method of open circuit time constants. But the first thing I'm going to do is actually short these capacitors as usual. Now, remember, these capacitors have a high pass effect. They kill off low frequencies. And in this lecture, we're going to study the effect of parasitic capacitances on high frequencies. So by the time you're up at that range of very high frequencies, these are really acting as shorts. So we're shorting the caps that are acting in a high pass capacity. Now to try to keep the remaining exposition compact, I'm going to basically replace everything looking out of every terminal with a Thevenin equivalent. So I'm going to take RC and RL and write that parallel combination as RTC. I'm going to take RE and R3 and write that parallel combination as RTE. And then let's see, the parallel combination of R1, R2, and RS going to ground, that's going to be written as RTB. And then I'm also going to take this voltage source out here and replace it with a Thevenin equivalent VTB according to a voltage divider rule. And we've done that a dozen times already, so I won't belabor the details here. Now, when you're looking at high frequency effects, it's commonplace to go ahead and include some base spreading resistance. This is an intrinsic part of the small signal model in this more extended sense. Now, usually what I like to do is I like to take this RX and fold it into capital RTB, but here I really need to leave it separate to make some things clear, in particular where the parasitic capacitances go. So, your BJT has a parasitic capacitance between the base and the collector. We'll call that C mu. That's called the diffusion capacitance. And this can vary with the currents in your circuits. So you should think about any solution that we create as being for some particular bias values. Now, there's also a parasitic capacitance between the base and the emitter called the depletion capacitance. This will vary with the collector to base voltage. So again, you'll assume that you've picked some bias point and this C pi is appropriate for that. Now, I should mention that because most of my own work is at audio ranges and not at the higher frequencies where these effects come into play, this is one part of EC3400 where I'm operating most outside of my comfort zone. So I'll be honest and tell you that I'm mostly just repeating things that I've heard Marshall Leach say. If it sounds like I'm saying something incorrect, let me know in the comments below. And in addition to the usual load resistance, let me introduce a parasitic load capacitance. Usually this comes from something like your cable, and a typical figure for that might be something like 10 to 30 picofarads per foot. And this can have an effect at audio frequencies on something like an electric guitar if you have 100 foot of cable, but it's subtle. Okay, so the name of the game with the method of open circuit time constants is we'll compute some worst case approximations on the basis of focusing on each capacitor in turn and basically opening up the others. So when we're looking at base frequencies, we shorted the capacitors we weren't looking at, and with high frequencies, we're gonna open the capacitors we're not looking at. All right, so let's focus on C mu, and I'm gonna open up C pi, and then what I'm about to do is just as easy to leave CL in the schematic, so I'm gonna leave it in the schematic. Anyway, if we get rid of C pi, 
we're left with something like this. Now, we have this BJT in a common emitter configuration, so it's acting as an inverting amplifier. And here we have a capacitance placed between the output and input of that amplifier. So that should immediately make you think about Miller's theorem, which we discussed in the previous lecture. Remember the idea of Miller's theorem is that we could replace a capacitor in the feedback loop of an inverting amplifier with a couple of capacitors to ground, one before the amplifier and one after the amplifier. We will indicate the capacitors associated with C mu that we added here by adding a B for base side to the subscript and a C for collector side to the subscript. So technically by Miller's theorem, C mu C would be the original C mu times one plus one over A, but it turns out in practice that the approximate open circuit time constant technique applied to this particular amplifier results in a situation where just taking C mu C to be equal to the original C mu gives you a more accurate answer. And this is not an argument based on A being large, so this term effectively goes away. This just gives you a better answer. Go figure. So let's compute this local gain A. And I'm calling it local gain to emphasize that it's not the full end-to-end -end gain of the amplifier starting from VTB or even further back with VS. Here we're taking V1, the voltage at the base, and we're modeling that as a voltage source right there at the base. So there's no resistance here. So if we know the current flowing into the BJT, we could multiply that current by RTC in parallel with RIC, which is the resistance seen looking down into the collector of the BJT. Now, like in the base response lecture, we'll explore an emitter-focused solution and say that the short circuit current associated with the Norton model for the collector is equal to alpha times IE, which is the current flowing through the emitter. Now, I should mention that this equation here is using that R0 equals infinite approximation. If we weren't taking that approximation, we would need some primes here, and this whole analysis would become a whole lot more complicated. It's a little bit confusing because we're sort of mixing our approximations here. We're not using this approximation when we compute RIC. So to figure out IE, we will use our Norton equivalent circuit looking into the emitter. And in the Norton equivalent circuit, you include the Thevenin equivalent voltage seen looking out of the base. And here, that's just V1. And you would normally have a special quantity here called RIE that would involve RE and the Thevenin equivalent resistance looking out of the base of the BJT. But there is no resistance here. So we can just write RE here. Isn't that cool? All right. So we can write IE equal V1 over RE plus RTE, this series resistance here, according to Ohm's law. And if we pile all of those equations together, we can write our gain formula as alpha over RE plus RTE times this parallel combination of RTC and RIC. Remember that we opened up the capacitors out here according to the open circuit time constant method, so we don't need to worry about them. Notice that the minus we put in our definition of A cancels with this minus sign so that A is positive. All right, so let's figure out some time constants. So we'll open up these caps here and focus on CUB. So when we do that, we'll take our wire cutters and snip here, and then we place this capacitor with an ohmmeter to measure the resistance seen looking out when we short the independent voltage source. So let's see, crawling out this direction, we'll see Rx plus RTB, and we'll see that in parallel with RIB, which is the resistance seen looking into the base of the BJT. And now I have to remember to multiply that by the capacitance. Now on the output side, I'll treat these capacitors as a single parallel combination. So in the time constant for the collector side, I'll just add those capacitances. All right, so looking out of the junction here, and the junction here, we wind up seeing basically just RTC to ground, and then 
are icy, the resistance looking into the collector to ground. So that's just a parallel combination. Now, given these time constants, I could take the reciprocals to get their associated frequencies and radians per second, and you would want to divide these by 2 pi if you wanted to get this in hertz. So we do need to compute things like RIB and RIC. So I've summarized the formulas for such things on this slide, just so this presentation can be somewhat self-contained. So here I have RIB, two different formulas you can choose from for RIC, and the second formula requires this RIE computation. One thing I want to point out is that we are having to explicitly add in RX here. So there's our base spreading resistance, and we're not automatically lumping it in with TB. We're adding that explicitly. Okay, so we focused on CMU for a bit. Let's now use the method of open circuit time constants and analyze the effect of C pi by opening up C mu. And I could say that we're also opening up CL, but it doesn't really much matter because what's happening out here doesn't really affect the computations we're about to do. So it's just as easy to leave it in the schematic. So I'm going to leave it there. Why not? All right. So here I have a certain amount of frustration. I don't have an elegant approach to this problem. One thing you may have noticed is that once we introduce the small signal model, the hybrid pi model or the T model, I only use those to create the Thevenin equivalent circuits for looking into the base and the emitter and the Norton equivalent circuit for looking into the collector. Other than that, I haven't touched the pi model or the T model, but I don't have a way to solve the problem we need to solve here using those equivalent circuits because C pi is connected to both the base and the emitter. So you would have to think about what is it like looking up into the emitter and expressing things based on what's happening at the base, but that sort of wraps back to the emitter through the capacitor. Similarly, your Thevenin equivalent circuit looking into the base involves your Thevenin equivalent looking out of the emitter but that now will look through the capacitor and wrap back around, and I can't get that to work out. The only way I know of to sort out what's happening with C pi is to go ahead and replace the BJT with one of these small signal equivalent models, either the hybrid pi model or the T model, and I'm going to use the pi model. So here's our pi, here's GM times V pi. Now what's V pi? V pi is usually written as VBE, but I want to make a distinction here because the base is technically out here on the left side of RX, but in the hybrid pi model that includes this base spreading resistance, you measure the voltage here. So we're labeling that V pi to make the distinction that it's not really the base. It's sort of this conceptual internalized base or something like that. So I have my voltage controlled current source. This is now very old school. All of these stuff looking out of the base and we can start playing some games here. So something I forgot to mention earlier is that we should confirm what effect C pi has and it does have a low pass filtering effect, a strict low pass filtering effect because at very high frequencies, this starts to look like a short. And if this is a short, well, V pi is zero, and if V pi is zero, then this current source is zero, then we don't have any current, so we don't have any voltage at the output. Now, the first thing you might think to do is to try to write some Kirchhoff's current law equation here, dealing with the current coming in, but Marshall Leach had a pretty cool idea, which is to replace everything looking down this direction with a Thevenin equivalent. So you basically have a difference of two voltages with some impedances in between them. And this will make the analysis we need to do look more like some analyses that we've done previously. And really, everything looking out this direction is like a Norton equivalent. So to make a Thevenin equivalent, we just do a source transformation. So this current source in parallel with this resistance will look like this resistance in series with a voltage source where you just take this current and multiply it by the resistance here. And doing that results in a circuit that looks like this. So here's the general idea. Remember we're looking for time constants. 
We're assuming that the output voltage has the form of a low-pass filter function times some constant. And when we're trying to find the time constant, whatever the big constant in front is doesn't really matter. Now, we know that output voltage is proportional to the collector current. Remember, we're using the R0 equals infinity approximation for this particular analysis. And that collector current is proportional to V pi. So if I can find a time constant for V pi, that's going to be the same time constant for V naught. So I'm going to take this parallel combination of C pi and R pi and call it Z sub pi. And so if we compute that parallel combination out explicitly, I multiply R pi times 1 over C pi in the numerator, and then I add these things in the denominator, and then let me multiply the numerator and the denominator by C pi s to clear out the fraction, and I'll write this as R pi over 1 plus R pi C pi s. So that's this impedance here. Now, if I want to think about what V pi is, well, I have a voltage divider. I have a voltage difference VTB minus GM V pi RTE, so that difference is here. Notice now I'm using uppercase letters to represent the Laplace domain versions of the variables, and I'm also usually suppressing the explicit notation of the S variable. So you can imagine VTB here has an S, and V pi here has an S. Everybody except the resistors has an S, but I'm avoiding writing the S to try to keep the equation small. Okay, so I have the voltage difference from here to here. That's given here. And then I write down a voltage divider. In the numerator, I have my Z pi, because that's the impedance associated with the V pi I'm trying to compute. And then in the denominator, I sum up all of the impedances. So I have RTB, RX, the Z pi there, and then this RTE. All right, now it's algebra time. We're over 16 minutes in. If you stuck it out this far, you can keep going. Please don't click away. So let's take this term here and leave it on the right-hand side. And as far as this term here goes, let's see, we'll multiply it by this z pi. And when we move it over to the other side, the minus turns into a plus and I'll factor out the V pi. So V pi times one gives us this term here. All right, so let me divide both sides of the equation by this mess here. And we can actually then write V pi equals a bunch of stuff times VTB. And now we need to simplify this bunch of stuff. So to clear the fraction, I'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by this RTB plus RX plus Z pi plus RTE factor here. So that kind of expression will go away here and it will replace the one sitting here, giving me an expression that looks like this. And let's see, I have a Z pi here and a Z pi here. So I can group those together and factor out a Z pi to write it like this. And at this point, I want to go ahead and fill in the expression for z pi. So that's something we calculated on the previous slide. All right, so the next obvious thing I need to do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by this one plus r pi c pi s term to clear that out. And when you do, these factors go away and you wind up with the same factor multiplying this mess of resistances here to give you an expression that looks like this. And at this point, what I would like to do is to take this GMRTER pi and play with that a little bit. Essentially what we can do is we can replace GMR pi with beta. Okay, so this factor here, this RTB plus RX plus RTE, I'll multiply that by one, so it'll still hang out. And then I'll also take that and multiply it through by r pi c pi s. That will give me an expression that looks like this. Okay, and now all I'm going to do is I'll take this term and put it at the end of the queue. And I want to do that because I want to get the s at the end here. So I've also taken RTE and beta RTE and rewritten that as one plus beta RTE.
And we're finally getting somewhere. So what I want to do is to take the numerator and the denominator and divide both of them by this expression here, because then I can write this in terms of stuff over one plus a bunch of other stuff times s, and that other stuff is a low pass filter time constant. Now we could figure out what the DC value of this transfer function is, but it doesn't matter. All we need is the time constant for our analysis. And that is this mess here. So I personally found doing five slides worth of algebra to be very intellectually unfulfilling. It was really, really tedious. And if by a miracle you stuck it out this far, thank you for sticking with me. If you know of an easier way, a more elegant way of getting to this result, please leave a comment below and also send me an email. So we computed three poles for low pass filter functions. How should we combine them? Remember a couple of lectures ago when we were looking at the low frequency response, we said that people would often combine these by summing up the squares of the poles and subtracting twice the squares of the zeros, and then you take the square root of that. Now for this high frequency analysis, we want to compute a worst case upper cutoff frequency. And there's a similar formula for that, except we sum up the reciprocals of the squares of the poles and the reciprocals of the squares of the zeros. Then after you take the square root, you take the reciprocal of that. Now in this particular example, we computed three poles. We didn't actually have any zeros. But put a pin in this question of zeros. I'm going to come back to that. Now, all of that complicated algebra became necessary because we had some emitter resistance down here. In the fully bypassed case, where R3 is equal to zero and hence RTE equals zero, this is a short. So if there's really no emitter resistance, this C pi is going straight to ground. And when I think about applying Miller's theorem to C mu, well, now I have my C mu B that comes from applying Miller's theorem to C mu, and I can just say that that's in parallel with C pi. So I can wind up with my two time constants as I originally had, where I'm just now adding C pi to that C mu B in my tau mu B time constant. So that's a lot easier to think about. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we didn't find any zeros in our analysis, but I told you to put a pin in that point, and let's go ahead and unpin it. So remember that all of this open circuit time constant stuff we did is an approximate analysis. If you do a detailed analysis that includes a small signal model, either the hybrid pi or the T model, and you include all the capacitors and you work everything out carefully, it turns out there is a zero that is introduced into the transfer function by C mu. So the way to think about this is that for frequencies that aren't too high, our BJT here is a common emitter amplifier. So if the voltage here goes up at the base, then the voltage here at the collector goes down. But as the frequency goes up, 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 this capacitor starts to look more and more like a short. And then the voltage going up here at the base would correspond to voltage going up here in the opposite direction. So basically what happens is as you go up in frequency, there can be a point where the amplifier switches from an inverting amplifier to a non-inverting amplifier. And that's very weird. It happens because the zero in the transfer function lands here on the right-hand side. So your transfer function is going to have a bunch of poles in the denominator and those poles are going to be on the left-hand side of the plane in order for the system to be stable. It has some happy constant sitting out in front. But if you look at the term for the zero, because it's on the right-hand side, it's going to look a little something like this. There's going to be a minus sign here, and that's what gives the system the opportunity to actually flip from an inverting to a non-inverting filter. Control theory people would say that the zero on the right-hand side corresponds to a phase lag. This kind of issue shows up when you're studying the stability of amplifiers, which is something I'll talk about later in the class. I remember Marshall Leach saying that this kind of issue could show up as an interview question, although to be honest, if I were to be asked about this in an interview, I couldn't tell you anything more than I just told you now.
And then I would also have to confess to the interviewer that I'm just repeating things that I learned from Marshall. Now, I did this analysis for the common emitter amplifier because the common emitter is an important amplifier type in its own right. But I also did it as an example of this kind of analysis that you could apply to other kind of amplifiers. So I'm not going to do the same kind of analysis for the common collector or the common bass, but you can use the kind of techniques I've discussed here to analyze those amplifier types or the various multi-transistor amplifier types that we looked at.